Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Margaret Farrell, and on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I'd like to welcome you to our July Research to Reality Cyber Seminar. NCI launched the Research to Reality Community of Practice five years ago with the aim of bringing together researchers and practitioners in an ongoing discussion around the promise and the perils of moving evidence-based cancer control programs and research into practice. And there's nothing I enjoy more about the summertime than the opportunity to dig into a good book. And I delight particularly when my children get captivated by their summer reading assignments. So I can't think of a better way for our summer r to r cyber seminar session than to look at the power of the narrative, specifically the role of effective narratives in cancer control prevention and implementation. And we have two wonderful women with excellent stories to tell in this regard. Dr. Sheila Murphy will help frame our discussion by looking at how the power and perseverance of a narrative or story structure has been recognized and utilized for thousands of years, and she'll talk about her work about how a narrative can most effectively convey crucial, potentially life-saving health information. And Sheila will review some of her research findings which identify the factors that make a narrative more or less persuasive. And then to illustrate how narratives can be a powerful tool in risk communication, Dr. Stephanie Wheeler will describe her study that uses patient narratives about endocrine therapy to understand racial variation and perceptions about risk and side effects. And Stephanie will discuss how narratives can serve as motivators to initiate and track adherence to endocrine therapy in diverse patient populations. Complete biographies of both our speakers can be found on researchtoreality.cancer.gov. The final part of our session, as always, is dedicated to your questions and sharing, and we invite you to share your story with us during the question and answer time. At any time during the presentation, you can put get in queue to ask your question live by pressing star 1, and the operator will queue your call. Or if you prefer, you can also submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the top of your screen. We specifically and we warmly welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. And we invite you to engage in the discussion today on the call and also online with the R2R community practice. We're very excited for all of you joining us here today. And so, Sheila, with all that housekeeping done, I'm delighted to turn this over to you and Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my co-investigators, particularly my co-PI, Lourdes Biasconde Garbanati, and my funder, NCI, who in 2009 gave us a transformative R01 to explore the use of narrative in health communication. So to start out, I'd, I'd like to show an example of the traditional approach to communicating vital health information in the United States. Um, and while it's painstakingly accurate, it's not particularly effective. So what I'd like to do today is to challenge you to consider using stories or narratives. Um, but before we begin, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to what constitutes a narrative. And over 2,000 years ago, Aristotle in Poetics uh, described a narrative as a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end that is understood by all. And that's really an excellent definition. Um, throughout my talk today, though, I'm going to be using Crater's definition of uh, a narrative as a representation of connected events and characters that has an identifiable structure, specifically a uh, beginning, a middle, and an end, is bounded in space and time, and contains implicit or explicit messages about the topic being addressed. And the reason I use Kreuter is because he also defines non-narrative, which he says is expository and didactic styles of communication that present propositions in the form of reasons and evidence supporting a claim, like the brochure I just showed you. I also want to clarify up front that the idea of using narratives or stories to transmit health information is, is not uh, new. It's actually been used primarily outside of the U.S., um, it's sometimes referred to as entertainment education or EE or narrative or storytelling, but all of it is the intentional placement of educational content in entertainment messages, and it's essentially a strategy for disseminating information and changing attitudes, norms, and behavior. 
So the theoretical backbone of entertainment education and virtually all other narrative approaches is uh, Bandura's social cognitive theory, which states that people are far more likely to mimic a behavior that they've seen being performed than one that was recommended but not shown or demonstrated. So a really commonly used strategy in persuasive campaigns is to physically model the behavior. And this physical modeling allows individuals who are unsure how to engage in a behavior um, to benefit by showing increased self-efficacy, gee, I could do that, uh, from watching others perform the desired behavior. But modeling can also in- impact, uh, very importantly, how common or normative the behavior is perceived to be and change something that we refer to as the subjective norm. And this is really important, particularly for continued behavior change, because you want people to have the perception that a desired behavior is is more common or normative, because those are the sorts of behaviors that are, that's the normative pressure that's likely to keep behavior change going. So here's an example of a storyline that, that effectively used modeling. Um, my colleagues at Annenberg's Hollywood Health and Society worked with 26, 26 different television shows on organ donations, trying to increase organ donations. And so this numbers storyline was the most effective out of all of them in having viewers actually sign up to become an organ donor because it clearly modeled how to become an organ donor, namely by going to the DMV. So I also want to point out that repetition, as long as the message is not inconsistent, repeating the message from various sources uh, can produce a stronger impact than any single narrative alone. And here's another example of the power of repetition. Um, My colleagues and I tested the impact of uh, two different uh, BRCA storylines that we knew were coming up within a month of uh, of the same time. And so the first storyline appeared on ER uh, and dealt with a young Jewish woman's decision of whether or not to have a prophylactic double mastectomy based on the presence of the BRCA gene. And it included the fact that 85% of women with this gene develop breast and, and or ovarian cancer and the importance of knowing your family's medical history. And the second storyline, which aired three weeks later on Grey's Anatomy, also featured a young woman struggling with a very similar decision. Um, and what we did is we used a, a pre-test, post-test design before people saw either storyline um, to survey three groups of women, uh, those who viewed only, ultimately, only the ER storyline, uh, those who viewed only the Grey's Anatomy storyline, and then we also surveyed a number of viewers who just so happened to watch both of them. And what you can see here is that the understanding of genetic risk in general, and the risk involved with the BRCA gene in particular, uh, was greatest for the the combined viewership here. Um, And also, as well as the increase in the intent to have a mammogram, um, also increased if you had watched both as opposed to either um, separately. So the point I'm trying to stress here is the power, potential power of message repetition as long as they're not inconsistent. So... Research also suggests that narratives may be uniquely qualified to overcome persuasive resistance, which is something we have to worry about with health messages, because stories tend to what we call reduce reactance. No one's going to tell me what to do or counter-arguing. I don't think that's true. Or selective avoidance, just avoiding the message altogether. Um, And at the same time, it models the desired behavior. It can increase our sense of self-efficacy and perceived vulnerability, In other words, we could do something and we should do something, and that acting uh, will be efficacious in inverting whatever the threat is. And finally, performing the actual behavior, again, can change the perceived norm with respect to how common the behavior is. Okay, so um, you're probably wondering at this point, if humans have been using stories to transmit crucial information for thousands of years, why does Western medicine all but ignore the use of narrative and instead rely on facts and figures continually, like the brochure I started with. Well, um, I asked this question years ago to Francis Collins, and he argued that from the standpoint of the government agencies like NCI, they are just being prudent. After all, he argued there's, there had never been a large-scale, tightly controlled experiment or clinical trial that presented the identical information in both a narrative or a story-based format and the more traditional traditional non-narrative format and compared their impact on the actual target audience. 
But our TR01 study, uh, which he funded, thank you very much, did exactly that. So uh, similar to a clinical trial, uh, however, you don't replace the existing cheaper drug unless the new drug is significantly better. So our research questions were, uh, do narratives convey health-related information better than non-narratives? And if so, uh, what theoretical mechanisms underlie changes in relevant knowledge, attitudes, and behavior? And I'm going to talk about two theoretical mechanisms in particular in just a bit. Um, but first, I want to show uh, the comparison of the narrative versus non-narrative. So here's our methodology. Uh, so to answer our research questions, we produced two 11-minute films that each conveyed the same facts regarding the cause of cervical cancer, which is the human papillomavirus, or HPV, as well as its prevention via the HPV vaccine and its detection via pap test or the new genetic test. Um, now, it's really important to note here that I just happened to work on cervical cancer, and we picked cervical cancer as, as the health issue to be uh, worked on with these films, but it could be any health-related um, health related topic. So this, this, my point being is this is really generalizable all through health communication. All right, so unfortunately at this point I usually show clips of the um, – Tamale lesson and its time, but uh, due to time and technology, we're, we're going. To, we've asked you offline to take a look at those, and there are clips available on NCI's R to R website. I know some of you have already looked, but just for those of you who haven't, let me let me show you uh, just uh, some still images. Here's uh, some still images from the non-narrative. It's time. Um, that uses a more traditional approach, featuring doctors, patients, and facts and figures, and compared to the, the narrative, which is called Tamale Lesson, uh, which revolves around a family's preparations for their youngest daughter's quinceanera or 15th birthday. Um, and here you see the four main characters in, in uh, Tamale Lesson, Lupita, the eldest daughter who finds out she has HPV, Connie, who is her virginal middle sister, uh, Blanca, who is their mother and who has not had a pap in a long time, and Petra, her friend who has never had a pap test. Okay, so here's the design of the overall study. So we first use a random digit dial procedure to randomly select and survey by phone a 1,000 women uh, between the ages of 25 to 45 who live in Los Angeles County. And the first thing we wanted to do is to establish their pretest or baseline level of cervical cancer-related knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, and this included 300 African-American, 300 European-American, and 300 Mexican-American women. We then, after we got pretest data, we, we randomly assigned these same women to recite, receive either the narrative or the non-narrative film in the mail and watch it in their, at their home. Um, and so today's presentation is going to focus at three time points. At time one is at baseline or pretest. Time two is within two weeks of having viewed one of the two films. And time three is a six-month follow-up that allowed a sufficient amount of time to pass to track actual behavior. Did they go get a pap test. All right, so um, we predicted that compared to women who received the cancer-related information in a nonfiction, non-narrative format, those who received the same information in a fictional narrative format would have increased knowledge with respect to cervical cancer risk, screening, treatment, and prevention, more positive attitudes towards screening behaviors, and most importantly, increased behavior, getting a pap test or at least making an appointment to do so. So in this slide, what you see is, um, by the way, the striped bars are the non-narrative and the um, solid bars are the narrative. We worked really hard not to stack the deck by making a terrible uh, non-narrative. And um, both of our films, just to be uh, clear, were exactly the same length. They had the same facts about cervical cancer, and they were produced by our same production team. So they had really high production quality, um, which you know if you've looked at the, at the clips. So um, as a result, both films produced an increase in cervical cancer-related knowledge at the individual level from before pretest to after post-test. Um, but this shift was greatest with an increase of almost two more correct answers out of a possible nine facts um, that were covered equally in both films among women who saw the narrative film. So 
both films worked in terms of increasing knowledge, but the narrative worked, tended to work a little better, particularly for the Mexican-American and the African-American women. Okay, but what about actual behavior? Okay, so looking at this, this is pre-test data. These, these uh, gray bars represent the percentage of women in our sample who actually had a pap test within the past six months, and that meant they weren't due for a pap test during the time of our study. Um, so if you look at this distribution, what you see is that uh, significantly more European Americans, before they saw either film, were likely to have had a pap test in the last six months uh, compared to the uh, – so almost half of our European Americans had a pap test within the last six months compared to only 37 percent of our African Americans and 32 percent of our Mexican Americans overall. And this suggests that an ethnic diversity exists in screening at pretest, and, and this is not unlike the ethnic diversity that actually does exist in the real population. These numbers are very similar to L.A. County numbers. Um, but the blue bars here show what happened six months out after our um, women saw one of our two films. And in each case, the light blue segment of each bar shows the percent who had been screened within our six-month window after seeing one of the two films. And the dark blue caps are people who had made an appointment but hadn't yet gotten in for their appointment. So, again, both films increased screening, but the narrative was more effective than the non-narrative in doing so. And what I really find exciting about this result is that the ethnic disparity in screening that we saw at pretest is erased uh, at six months for the Mexican-American and African-American women. In fact, the Mexican-American women in our sample went from having the lowest screening rate of overall 32% to the highest screening rate overall 82%. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so we're not suggesting that it's ethnicity per se, that predicts um, these effects. But in fact, uh, the extent to which women identify with or become with the characters or become immersed in the story that matters. So um, because we had deliberately featured primarily Hispanic characters in both films, um, we expected that the Mexican-American women in our sample would be more transported, also referred to sometimes as immersed, absorbed, engaged, or involved in the story and that they would identify more strongly with the primary characters that I described. So from this point on in my talk, I'm going to focus only on those women who saw the narrative film to try to figure out, uh, tease out why, why the narrative worked better for some women than others, okay? All right, and so one of the, one of the key factors is, has to do with something called transportation. Um, one of the main advantages of using an entertainment education strategy over a traditional public health campaign that employs public service announcements or clinic brochures is that the use of narratives um, can lead viewers to become what we call transported, to use Green's term, into the narrative world where you suspend disbelief and you uh, don't counter-argue. So we measured the extent to which Green and Brock's construct of transportation or involvement with the narrative more generally influenced viewers' knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. So what did we find? We found that those who reported being most engrossed or transported by Tamale Lesson showed the greatest shift in cervical cancer knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Okay, and who is most likely to be transported or engaged by Tamale Lesson? Again, it's the Mexican-Americans, which we predicted, but something that we didn't predict but later figured out what was going on, which is the African-American sample also um, really liked uh, the Tamale Lesson, and, and to the extent they were transported, they ended up um, actually engaging in the behavior that we were interested in, okay? Um, the second factor that really mattered was the level to which women identified with the characters, um, particularly the positive role model of Lupita. So um, as I mentioned earlier, modeling of behavior uh, allows for vicarious learning and really plays a pivotal role in behavior change, but not all models are equally effective. We pay more attention to and we learn more from models with whom we identify, like, feel as if we know, or perceive to be similar to us. And typically, when you're 
when you're with unknown people or unknown characters, we tend to rely heavily on readily available physical cues to see if somebody's like us or whether we're going to like them, um, such as gender, age, and ethnicity. So following Moyer Gousset's, we use the term identification to refer to this overarching category of four related constructs, each of which were measured on a 10-point scale from not at all to a great deal. And those four related constructs are liking, similarity, wishful identification, uh, which is how much would you like to be like, and parasocial interaction, how much do you feel like you know. Um, and those four constructs hung together as one single factor. And, what, and we found that women in our study who identified with Lupita, uh, who's the eldest daughter who has HPV, showed the greatest shift in knowledge, attitude, uh, and behavior. And again, who tended to identify more strongly with Lupita, as you see here, that's the, the three bars on the left-hand side of your screen, um, that again tended to be the uh, Mexican-Americans in our sample and the African-Americans in our sample. And you can see here that um, identification is really stronger also for Connie. Um, and Interestingly, uh, Petra, who was supposed to be the mother's friend, who was supposed to be a transitional character going from being a negative role model to a positive role model, um, identifying with Petra turned out not to be a good thing. You started out with low knowledge, and you ended up with low knowledge. Okay. All right, so what can we conclude? Well, we can con conclude that narratives can be a valuable tool in health communication, um, particularly if the desired behavior can be physically modeled rather than sh and shown rather than just discussed, and if audience members become immersed in or transported into the narrative. Uh, and this may require the help of professional screenwriters and filmmakers. I like to give this quote by Mark Twain, which is, I like a story well told, and that is the reason I sometimes am forced to tell them myself. But unfortunately, I'm not Mark Twain, and I would argue that probably you're not either. So please do consider uh, that there are professionals who do this for a living and that they're very good storytellers, or at least, if not, if you can't afford uh, interacting with a professional storyteller, you might want to pretest, pretest, pretest your material to make sure they're having the intended effect on audience members. So um, narratives featuring positive role models, that, particularly that underserved populations can identify with, may be helpful in reducing health disparities, but again, if those, but you want to pretest whether those characters have the intended effect on audience members. And you also want to pretest whether the narrative resonates with all segments of the population. Um, and if not, you might want to consider using different versions for, depending on age, gender, and or culture. Um, for example, here's a quote from one of our uh, European American um, focus groups. It said, um, anyone can relate to a warm family. That was well done. but." quote, unquote, it's Hispanic. You're not going to be showing it to a bunch of white women in Beverly Hills. So even though it worked fine for them, you could see that the European Americans never identified as much as the Mexican American and African Americans in our sample. Um, so you want to know that up front. And the impact of different stories can be additive if the if it's uh, you repeat the same message, even if it's different characters, different storylines. But again, you don't want to be inconsistent in those repetitions. So I'm going to leave you with just some factors, some of which I've covered, some of which I haven't, that we know increase narrative impact. So, for example, um, explicit physical modeling of the desired behavior, ties to perceived social norms that can actually cause your behavior to, to sort of self-sustain after your intervention, Interpersonal discussion of the desired behavior, if you can get people talking. Um, increasing viewers' sense of self-efficacy. Um, liking a character. Identification based on perceived similarity or wishful identification. You wish you were like someone. Feeling like you know a character as you would a, a friend, which is called parasocial interaction. Repetition of the message even across different stories. And finally, and most importantly, I would say transportation into the story or involvement into the narrative. Without that, you're not going to see the, the increased impact of narrative. Okay, so um, in closing, I want to provide some of the references for you uh, to some of the things that I've cited and some readings if you're interested. And I also want to uh, 
thank my colleagues and my funders and you for your attention. Thank you. So now um, I'm going to lead right into Stephanie's talk, and she's going to follow up, and then we'll have take time for questions at the end. Okay, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Sheila. So I'm really pleased to be here with you all today to tell you about my research, which is focused on endocrine therapy decision-making in breast cancer patients. So just to briefly orient you to my talk today, I'll give a bit of background information about what uh, hormone receptor positive uh, breast cancer is, share with you briefly some of the methods that we engaged in for our in-depth interviews, as well as the stories and the results that came through that process. And then I want to talk about Get Set, which is a motivational interviewing intervention that we're developing currently to optimize endocrine therapy use. So by way of background, um, hormone receptor positive breast cancer is comprised of both estrogen and progesterone receptive positive tumors. And these account for 70% of new breast cancer diagnoses, but proportionately fewer breast cancer-specific deaths. And part of the reason for that is because people with hormone receptor breast cancer are actually eligible to take oral endocrine therapy. And this is a really important medication um, for them in terms of reducing their risk of recurrence and also is considerably less toxic than, for example, chemotherapy. So the way that endocrine therapy works is there's two different classes of medication. One is estrogen blockers, which prevent estrogen from binding to cancer, cancer cell receptors. The most commonly uh, heard of drug here is tamoxifen. And then the second group is estrogen-reducing drugs, which are also called aromatase inhibitors. And these reduce the amount of estrogen that's made in a woman's body. And these include uh, letrozole and astrozole and exomethane. So typically, endocrine therapy begins after primary breast cancer treatment has completed. So for the majority of women, this would include surgery, of course, and then for others, um, perhaps radiation and or chemotherapy. And endocrine therapy is known after five years to reduce the risk of recurrence by up to 40% and mortality by a third. And actually, new data are emerging that suggest that the benefits of endocrine therapy are much greater if continued for 10 years. And as a result of that, the American Society for Clinical Oncology actually recommends continuing endocrine therapy for 10 years to receive the full benefit. Unfortunately, uh, this drug is not well utilized in the population. Um, medication adherence is fairly low, and initiation is actually quite low as well. So some data that, that we put out a couple of years ago in the Medicaid population showed that up to 50% of women who are insured by Medicaid actually never start endocrine therapy. And in commercially insured and Medicare insured populations, it's also low, although quite, not quite as low as it is in the Medicaid population. And within the women uh, who start endocrine therapy, um, some, some data that were uh, compiled in a recent systematic review by Caitlin Murphy and colleagues suggested that up to 60% of people who initiate do not take endocrine therapy as prescribed, and almost 70% in some cases have stopped the therapy altogether by five years. And so this is really a problem. Um, in addition to that, there hasn't been a lot of data that has been sufficiently powerful to look at differences in endocrine therapy use by race, although we've put out a systematic review in the past year um, beginning to look at this and have found that um, usage is actually quite mixed in terms of race and ethnicity. But we know that under-treatment of black women in particular is a consistent problem across other types of breast cancer treatment, including surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And importantly, if endocrine therapy use is a problem by race, then that could lead to some of the differences in survival that we see for breast cancer patients overall, but in particular may explain some of the, the huge disadvantage that we see within this hormone receptor subtype in particular. So we know that black women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer seem to suffer the largest survival disadvantage among different uh, tumor subtypes. And this is really illustrated here by this graph, um, which comes from the Carolina Breast Cancer Study. In this particular study, you can see that among the luminal A, which is the subtype um, that's closely associated with hormone receptor positive disease, the hazard ratio for race, and this is comparing African-American women to white women, is actually the largest and the most statistically significant in terms of predicting survival. Um, and this is controlling for all of the other things that we know to affect breast cancer specific mortality, like age, date of diagnosis, and stage. And so really this, this 
study um, suggests that while biology is important in determining outcomes, which you can see here, um, the greatest survival disparity seems to be concentrated within those women who have hormone receptor positive disease, suggesting that really there are non-biological factors at play here, one of which may be differences in endocrine therapy use. And here's some additional data that, that our group has put out that shows that um, within commercially insured populations, the difference um, between endocrine therapy uh, initiation by race seems to be focused in people who have received chemotherapy, which perhaps suggests that African Americans in particular reach a point of treatment saturation once they finish chemotherapy. They're unwilling or unable to continue uh, with endocrine therapy as well. So in light of these data, we were really interested in understanding from a qualitative perspective what were the reasons for non-initiation and non-adherence, particularly within African Americans, but also just more generally in the population of women who are prescribed this drug. And so really we set out to understand the decision-making process, including the more nuanced reasons for non-initiation and non-adherence. And to do this, we recruited 54 women who have hormone receptor positive disease who were prescribed endocrine therapy. We also recruited 20 oncology care providers and interviewed them at length as well. I won't have time to present their data today, um, but I will share a couple of um, example narratives and, and some ideas about those interviews. So we had three groups of women. Um, we had non-initiators who chose not to start taking the drug, and this was eight women. We had non-adherers who started endocrine therapy but were not fully adherent or discontinued altogether, and there were 15 of them. And then a little over half of our sample was adherers, and these are women who started endocrine therapy, were mostly adherent, and they continued to stay on the drug. So starting out with the non-initiators, what we found here in terms of the narrative experience, and I want to say that um, there were lots of thematic findings from these interviews, and I'm not going to go through all of those today. I'm really just going to focus on the role of the narratives in particular. So what we found among the non-initiators was that um, they really researched endocrine therapy quite extensively, and they very actively sought guidance from other women like them. So one woman said, you know, I researched it, I read about it, I talked to people who took it, I talked to people who didn't take it. I had one friend who took tamoxifen, and she didn't have one bit of trouble with it. Other people said it was horrible. I read comments on the Internet, and many people thought that it was pure hell. Another woman said, my friends who took tamoxifen were telling me they felt like they were surviving for five years but not living. And that's an important theme that we see over and over again. And most of this um, hellish experience, if you will, is focused on the side effect burden that people uh, went through. And so the vast majority of women that we interviewed and also the majority of women who we um, examined in our Carolina Breast Cancer Study data did experience side effects. And these ranged from hot flashes to joint pain being the most significant, as well as some rarer side effects. And so people's ability to balance the side effect burden with the um, beliefs about the benefits of this drug in terms of its risk uh, of recurrence were really quite key. Another thing that came through with regard to narratives in the non shares is that this group didn't really want to give other women advice but rather they encouraged women to undergo a similar information search like they did. And so one woman said, what's a good for me is not necessarily appropriate for someone else. You have to be sure within yourself that you're making the right decision, but you need to get the information. Another woman said, I wouldn't want to give any kind of advice. I would say do your research, talk to professionals, and then make your decisions based on that information. So with cures, by contrast, um, Rather than seeking out other women very actively to talk to, um, many adherers purposefully avoided seeking out information um, from other women like them, but they did consult their doctors quite extensively. This woman said, I heard too many negative things. I'm not one of those people who gets on the computer and looks things up. I know that all medications have side effects, and if you start looking for them, perhaps you're more likely to have them. I didn't want to be that person who was looking for things that might happen. As I mentioned, adherers generally follow their physician's treatment recommendations to a T, but importantly, they preferred that their physicians present that information in the context of the narrative. And I can tell you from the provider interviews that this wasn't something that providers routinely did. Rather, physicians seem to rely very heavily on statistics to present uh, risk recurrence information 
as opposed to stories about either um, their own experience as practitioners or the experience of patients that they had treated. And so I think this is a, a point for uh, providers to perhaps take notes about the way that um, risk communication can be relayed in effective manners. So this woman said, I asked most of my questions to the doctor. I wanted to get the information from him. And then another woman said, doctors should give data, but interpret it, not just a statistical analysis, such as the mean distribution was, but really a narrative. And this came through in, in several interviews. Importantly, adherers wanted to share their experiences, and they really wanted to encourage other women to at least try infant therapy even though they didn't um, always seek this type of guidance themselves from peers. And so really this group was very much willing to, to share their experiences, to participate in support sessions and other uh, mechanisms for, for getting their story out. So this woman said, I tell a friend you should take it so you won't get breast cancer again and you'll live a longer, healthier, and happier life. Another woman said, I would definitely tell them to take it. I'd also tell them if one of the drugs isn't working, they should try another one. And this is a very common coping approach, if you will, for dealing with some of the side effect burden of these drugs, is that clearly there are multiple options available. And so frequently providers, when women are encountering problems with side effects, they will try a different drug. And, and often that, that works just fine in terms of um, women uh, being able to withstand some of the um, burden of the side effects. By contrast, the non-adherers were different from both the non-initiators and the adherers in that they didn't seem to seek the narratives or experiences of other women um, as a whole, nor did they express um, a need to share their experiences with others quite as much as the other group. They did, however, seek information and narratives from their uh, providers as well as from women that they found on the Internet. But this woman said, I got enough information. I remember grilling the doctor, saying something like, give me a reason why I should take this. And another woman said, my husband and I would go to the doctor visit with a stack of articles and questions, and she didn't seem to mind. The non-adherers um, as well uh, were a very heterogeneous group. And so, um, in particular, this has led us to rethink our intervention design strategy, recognizing the importance of tailoring these messages um, for optimal adherence to specific women. So because the non-adherers were so different, many of them had issues with side effects, particularly uh, joint pain and hot flashes. Those are very different side effects from one another, and so the strategies to deal with them are obviously going to be quite different. But some of the women that we talked to who were non-adherent described um, having other competing demands that really affected their ability to remember to take the medication and to make uh, the medication-taking process um, a behavior that they wanted to continue to engage in. And then others describe just different perceptions about the benefits um, of this drug and, you know, really not understanding um, their risk of recurrence, not understanding the information about how this drug um, acted. And there was a lot of confusion around endocrine therapy versus hormone replacement therapy. And so we realized that through talking to non-adherers that we needed a very person-specific and patient-centered approach um, to, to really try to improve this behavior which leads us to uh, where we are now with developing this intervention. So Get Set is an intervention that uh, we've designed, which stands for Guiding Endocrine Therapy Success Through Empowerment and Teamwork. And um, again, this is a motivational interviewing focused intervention uh, for women who've been prescribed endocrine therapy. It allows a diverse group of participants to really guide their own value-based decision-making. So again, this is a very tailored and person-specific approach. But it employs narratives from women like me, which we know from Sheila's work to be very impactful. We also know from our own data how impactful um, these narratives can be. But it also employs narratives from providers and tries to use more of that um, narrative and storytelling style as opposed to the didactic kind of information um, that Sheila was talking about that's a little bit more traditional but perhaps not as effective. And this encourages women to share experiences with their motivational interviewing counselor as well as their support community, whether that be, that be their spouse, their family members, their support group, their friends, and others. In terms of the elements of the narratives that are currently employed and get set, we really approach narratives in a couple of different ways in the intervention design. First and foremost, we um, are developing an introductory DVD 
which, as you've learned from Sheila on film, can, can be a really effective strategy and mechanism to reach patients. And in this film, um, we include diverse, culturally and ethnically diverse patients as well as providers to share these stories, again, in a very um, conversational manner and a, in a, a very um, personal manner as opposed to a fact-based manner. We also have a, a resource manual that includes quotes um, from our in-depth interviews. And again, the goal here is to share stories from women like me. That resource manual also includes a linkage um, to support groups consisting of women like me. So this is um, unique to, um, to our community, and so this, of course, could be modified for other communities. And then lastly, we're considering using um, breast cancer survivors as our MI counselors, and there's some evidence to suggest that um, the use of survivors in this way can be really effective because there's this um, identification, like Sheila talked about, in terms of um, relating to a person and their experience and how that might um, affect your own decision-making. In terms of um, that resource guide and some of the quotes that we use, here's an example of some of um, the uh, information that we provide regarding why other women chose endocrine therapy. And these quotes range from um, understanding the biology behind how the drug works and a woman describing how she interprets that um, information, as well as the trade-off that, again, women are making this risk-reward um, trade-off that women are thinking about as they're making those decisions. Also, we have some quotes about the psychological and emotional empowerment that comes along with taking this drug. And a lot of women talk about this in our in-depth interviews, the idea that you're taking charge of your health by being able to take this drug every day. Some other women talked about, um, you know, sort of a why not strategy. If you've come this far, it's worth a try um, to start endocrine therapy and see how it goes. And then lastly, um, we asked some questions in our in-depth interviews about what was the most compelling reason for you that, that you decided to do endocrine therapy. And one of the most common answers we received is that it really related to risk perception, that it was very empowering, very motivating, um, that there was something that these women can do to increase the odds of being cancer-free and remaining cancer-free. And so we made sure that we included that kind of story um, in the resource guide as well. So where we are now is we're in the process of pre-testing our materials um, by recontacting the women who we previously interviewed to participate in focus groups to react to the material that we put together. And in particular, um, you know, we're looking for things like identification. Are the characters that we're employing relatable? Um, transportation? Um, are the, the storylines that we're providing, do they get a sense of immersion and engagement with the story and, and with the behavior? We're also going to be seeking oncology provider input about the intervention and, of course, revising our material based on the provider and patient um, input. And then we'll be piloting the intervention in clinic um, with 40 women and hopefully um, scaling up and evaluating the intervention in a multi-site trial, um, hopefully in the near future. So in terms of um, closing, I think it's important um, to understand that the role of narratives here can be incredibly motivating, incredibly empower empowering for people who are undertaking a behavior like uh, medication adherence. But again, and as Sheila has really um, uh, highlighted, it's important that you use those narratives wisely and that you think very carefully about things like physically modeling the behavior. So, you know, we include things like showing women taking these pills with their glass of water. Um, you know, we're considering uh, showing women with their text-based uh, message reminders and things like that on their phones um, to help people remember to take the drug. It's important that there's that message repetition that Sheila talked about, that they're hearing the same message from multiple different sources, and as always, ensuring that identification and transportation are key, that people both identify with your characters and that they feel immersed in the storyline. And for something like improving racial variation in endocrine therapy use, we have to be very careful about that just to make sure that our characters are, um, are culturally relatable. So in closing, I want to just quickly thank my collaborators, in particular my research assistants Megan Roberts and Jenny Spencer, as well as um, program coordinator Krista Martin, and um, my, my close uh, partner, uh, research partner Katie Reeder Hayes, who is a um, breast oncologist at UNC, as well as some others. And I want to acknowledge funding from the American Cancer Society, as well as the University Cancer Research Fund. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you so much, Sheila. Very appreciative to both of you and what um what interesting um perspectives both of you bring to this issue as well. Um it's great to see 
um, the common threads through both of your presentations. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in already, and I just remind everybody um, it, that if you'd like to ask a question live over the phone to um, press star 1, and the operator will, um, will let us know that you're in the queue. Or you can type your question using the Q&A feature um, at the top of the screen. So um, our first question came in um, that from um, Rebecca who asks, I may have missed um, where, Sheila asked, where Sheila said why African-American women also strongly identify with the narrative video. And she, can she repeat why that was? Oh, thank you very much for the question. I actually, um, I think I may have skipped that. Uh, the African-American women in our sample, and we're not sure if this is a, a Los Angeles thing uh, because they tend to live in similar areas to our Hispanic women, or if it's just um, having seeing someone who is as one of our African-American focus group respondents, they didn't want to see one of those white people again, was what they said. Um, and so I think the idea is that many of these people live uh, in similar areas, they interact a lot, um, and so I think that it was it was the sort of the novelty of seeing um, a you know they're no longer an ethnic minority, um, but uh, seeing someone who wasn't a European American on screen and and thought they thought that that was so refreshing and they they really resonated with Tamale Lesson shows this scene in mean, the kitchen getting ready for a party. And so they really resonated with that kitchen scene as well and, and sort of the family aspect, particularly the female members of the family, was very resonant for the African Americans. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and a, a related question, um, Stephanie, this came in during yours, but I think it's applicable to, um, to both. Um, Mike Stefanik asks, um, have you found the narrative effect to be more effective based on variables such as gender or age? Uh, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, either, both. Say, we have not tested that yet, but I bet you that Sheila has. <laughs> so, um, but that's a great question and something we certainly want to explore when we're, when we're pilot testing. Yeah. Um, Sure. We've used uh, narratives with both males and females equally well. Um, there doesn't seem to be a gender difference, uh, per se. In terms of age, obviously somebody would have to be um, developmentally, for very small children, developmentally they have to be able to understand. But particularly, actually, kids have a hard time with sometimes with reasons and why they should do what you want them to do. And so I actually suspect, you know, uh, narratives probably work really well with kids. Um, and uh, the other age range would be, I suppose, the, the elderly. I don't see why they wouldn't be even perhaps more uh, resonant with the narrative strategy as well. So we haven't done the age one. We do know narrative works equally as well, although I will say that there are some individual level differences. That there are some people um, who prefer the statistics and the facts and figures. And so I think there's an individual level difference about that preference. So I should also clarify that clearly the, the gender difference is not as relevant for us working with <laughs> representation. <laughs> that, that, um, that's true, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was reacting more to the, to the age-based question. And um, one thing that I do recall from our in-depth interviews is that um, we, we found that more often older women seem to rely more on facts and figures from their providers um, as opposed to kind of talking about um, sharing their experiences with other women and also seeking out support groups and other information from women like them on the Internet. So, you know, I think that that's probably not specific to breast cancer, um, that that might be a theme that you see across age gradients um, and other disease areas as well. Mm. And, and perhaps that they're seeking out those narratives in those different contexts as well. Yeah. Um, great. Thanks. Aubrey has a question um, for you, Stephanie. Um, it, and she says, did Dr. Wheeler describe who will or should deliver the MI intervention? That's a great question. So um, MI has been delivered for medication adherence by a variety of different types of counselors, ranging from 
uh, navigators, uh, nurses, um, you know, lay people who are survivors um, and, and others. And so one of the things that we are currently deciding on is, you know, what kind of counselor we should employ. So we've considered, as I mentioned, using a breast cancer survivor. And there's been some data, not necessarily specific to, to the use of narratives, but, um, you know, peer support is, is, a, is a huge motivator for a lot of women. And so that might be a good strategy Although we're a bit concerned because we initially thought that we would use um, a nurse-trained navigator instead, given that this is a medication that's associated with a lot of side effects um, and it might require more clinical interaction, we thought perhaps that a nurse navigator might be better qualified to deliver it. So one of the things that we're going to be doing in the service group sessions is actually asking these patients themselves, you know, would this make more sense or would you prefer for it to be delivered? by a survivor um, like you or, or by someone who's a nurse navigator. Um, I can tell you that the providers we've spoken to are, are somewhat reticent to have a nurse who's already employed in their clinic delivering this because, of course, workloads start to interfere with that. So, um, you know, for practical reasons, having a survivor involved might make more sense. Great. Thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense. And Stephanie, it occurred to me during the presentation, I really should say, you know, we're looking forward to um, continuing the conversation with both of you, but um, we really want to stay tuned, too, as you go through. Um, nothing excites us more than conversations around scale-up, you know, um, and sustainability, Stephanie. So we want to keep in touch around all those things as the project progresses. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have a question that just came in from um, Ninjin who asked, I have a question for Dr. Murphy. I'm wondering if there was a question on intention to get a PAP test at the baseline, and thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I am a ardent fan of the late, great Marty Fishbein, who always says you have to not only measure behavior but um, behavioral intent. Uh, and we did have whether they had had a PAP test. Uh, we asked about their most recent PAP test and also whether they intended to have a PAP test in the next six months. And so we do have behavioral intent and behavior at all at all three time points in our study, and it really just mirrored the behavioral data that I just presented. It wasn't that there was this. Uh, in other words, um, the European Americans, if they hadn't had a recent Pap test, they were again more likely to intend to have one. Um, but the Mexican Americans and the African Americans in our sample were less less not only less likely to have recently had one. Uh, a PAP test, but also less likely to intend to have one in the next six months. Thank you for that question. That was a good question. Okay. And did that? Hey, and did Farrell. that? Yes. Sorry, this is the operator. I just want to let you know we do have a question from the phones. Oh, okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Your line is open. Oh, hi. It's Lorna Larson calling from Canada, and I just thought I'd share a successful. Um, social marketing campaign that we've developed actually to reach young women on college and university campuses with their bre breast cancer risk. And we've been um, initiating this since 2008 and evaluating both pre and post. And part of it is traditional uh, strategies. And we are also using storytelling too around um, uh, my daughter actually, Shanna, who lost her life to breast cancer at the age of 24 and it's her face that certainly gets the attention of the young women on campus and her story that has resonated with them across all cultures and ethnic backgrounds. So uh, we've been getting consistent, uh, re uh, consistent results to our evaluations, and certainly it seems to be making a, a significant difference in their knowledge level and their understanding of their risk and taking action and intent to take action. So. It's been, been very positive all around. Oh, great. Martin, thank you so much for the call and for sharing your story. And I will um, follow up with you because we'd really like to capture this as part of the um, discussion as well. And what do you find to be the most, um, what has made the, the most difference? You feel that it's um, the relatability of um, your daughter to other young women? Oh, for sure. And I think, actually, as Sheila was mentioning, it's two things. One, they can immerse themselves in the story, um, but also they can identify with Shanna. And they will say to me, oh, my goodness, you know, this could be me. This could be my best friend. And uh, so that has been certainly very positive as well. 
And just I'll just throw it out there. Our organization is Team Shan, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness for Young Women, and uh, we can you can check out our evaluation reports on the website under publications, and it's teamshan.ca. Great. Thank you. I'll be following up with you later today. Thank you ever so much for your call. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciated being online and hearing it. And I did have one, just a a little uh, request from Sheila. Could she say again who the source was for the definition that she used today? Oh, uh, certainly. Um, Croyder. And it's actually, um, it's listed on that slide. It's Croyder and his colleagues. Um, it does some great work with narrative with African American women. I, I want to give a strong plug for him. And also, uh, if you look, I, I, in my references, I also put some of my uh, research. And if you look under, I know, for example, in the most recent um, uh, one that's just in AJPH, which is uh, 2015, I cite him. So if you if you want his definition, the specific citation will be in that. Uh, in my article that's um, the second one down there, which is uh, the second one on this list of references, um, that's in the American Journal of Public Health. It just came out. Um, And so, yeah, he'll be cited there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And I realize we're getting um, to the top of the hour, so what... um what I'll do is I'll, I'll thank our, um, our speakers and, and invite, I know we have some questions pending, and we'll move the, um, the conversation over to um, researchtoreality.cancer.gov, um, and you can find the links to um, Stephanie and Sheila's presentation and their resources, as well as the two videos that, um, that Sheila referenced on there. So we'll be continuing our discussion later and hopefully we'll have the archive up this time next week as well. We'll be taking the month of August off to kind of catch our breath and we'll also be replatforming the Research to Reality Community of Practice. So um, we will keep moving forward and we have um, an exciting program coming up in the fall as well. So. Um, Your feedback is important to us, and we um, encourage you to complete our online evaluation, and the link to the survey will be sent in an email um, momentarily. So um, finally, we'd like to um, thank our speakers again. I think Sheila and Stephanie did a masterful job um, on reaching so many important topics today, and we're very appreciative of their time, both in preparation as well as in the presentation. And we look forward to um, inviting you to engage with Stephanie and Sheila on Research to Reality and, um, and engaging with each other on that platform as well. So thank you so very much for your attention, and we look forward to reconnecting with you back on Research to Reality. Thank you so much. That concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect at this time.